So I'll get I'll I'll get started here first with uh, my a little bit of background on on me to give me credibility really. So uh, you'll listen more attentively to what I have to say. <laughs> um, so I've had the good fortune to to play a key role as a founder or senior executive in building six successful startups to liquid outcomes. Uh, two of those we took public to the NASDAQ. Uh, one of those was a company called Ashton Tate that made a product called DBase that in the early days of the PC industry, we, we built to be the, the leading database on microcomputers uh, around the world. That was a lot of fun. Third largest microcomputer software company at that time in the world. Um, and then I went on, the second IPO was Symantec, where I was uh, executive VP from the beginning, and also a general manager of the largest divisions and the most uh, strategic acquisitions that we did in building the business. I would say this, that uh, the Ashton Tate IPO was, was uh, not managed optimally. Um, I was VP of sales there had to deliver a lot more than in, in some interesting circumstances than was supposed to be the case. And in the case of Symantec, we did a very much better job uh, with a guy called Bob Dykes, a CFO, of building the culture, the preparation, and uh, the roadmap so that we could be more predictable post-IPO. It was a very good experience. Um, with a good friend, Safi Quareshe, who's the S of AST Computers, an older computer company, he and I formed a venture firm in Irvine as well, called Irvine Ventures. That was a lot of fun in the first internet bubble. I launched Manhattan Street Capital five and a half years ago because of Reg A+, because to me, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal fundraising system. It's very well written, lots of pragmatic pragmatic aspects to it that uh, one doesn't often see. Uh, and there's a huge need. We all, we all know there's a huge need to be able to raise growth capital for companies at attractive, on attractive terms. And it's, to my mind, Reg A Plus is going over time to become a very large funding, fundraising system. Um, in the year 2019, just over a billion dollars was raised, which puts it at the same level as private placements as a category. And I imagine, I expect this year, 2020, will be significantly more, more like a $1.3 billion number, which would put the whole, the amount of, raise, of money raised to date in Reg A plus around $3.6 billion, which is worthwhile. The average in 2019 was $23 million per, per Reg A plus. Um, so Manhattan Street Capital, we are a funding platform and consulting company. We help companies figure out if they should use Reg D, if they should use Reg A plus, and, uh, and, and how to go about it to the extent we're allowed to. We're not a broker dealer deliberately. Um, we, uh, we are very careful to not cross any lines into broker dealerdom. Our fee structure is simple and relatively, relatively low cost. And um, we attempt to add a great deal of value throughout, before, during, and after our client companies have uh, done their raises. So we are selective. Um, we, we don't do Reg CF. We might do it. We might start to, we may add Reg CF subsequently because it's now been increased in scale. But um, we're really striving from the beginning to, uh, to appeal to more ambitious companies that are raising larger sums to do more ambitious things uh, with Reg A Plus as an instrument. So we, we've been attracting uh, companies that wish to raise and can justify raising larger sums of money, as well as having participated in Reg A Plus IPOs uh, in a number of instances already. Again, thanks to Akosh for doing a lot of work to make this webinar take place. Thank you to all of you for participating. I hope that uh, we can make this uh, a worthwhile use of your time. The agenda, please do look at the legal disclaimers that are in the chat stream. Please post questions there uh, in order to give me questions to answer at the end of this, of this session. And, um, yeah, so now I'll review the agenda and then get going. We're at 
So the agenda is briefly what is Reg A plus and what are its advantages as an IPO instrument. A um, couple of methods of going to the NASDAQ using Reg A plus, the schedule side of things, cost and marketing methodology, OTC listings, uh, the ins and outs of them, them. Um, secondary offerings, briefly, um, divisions of large companies and how they can use Reg A plus, as well as how companies can make continuous raises via Reg A plus on a year in year out basis. And then we'll cover uh, post offering liquidity, as well as uh, then I'll get into tips and mistakes to avoid to the extent this time, and we'll get into a Q&A. Excuse the paper, this is really just a useful way to remind me of what I want to cover. Interesting, the, the number of IPOs so far this year exceeds any in recent history, 461 IPOs year to date. Uh, the highest until then was 397 in the year 2000, which was obviously a very unique year unto itself. Uh, in 2019, there were 233 IPOs. So we, we already know it, you already are aware of it, but it's been a very hot year. A lot of that's to do with the Fed stimulus, obviously. Um, which is engaged to help us recover from the COVID virus problem. So Reg A plus briefly, anyone can invest from anywhere with only a few country exceptions. Uh, they don't have to be wealthy. Um, the nature of most of many of the Reg A plus investors is that they are optimists instead of, uh, I would say many of the most Reg D investors are pessimists. 60% of the investments come in usually via smartphone. And, you know, out of 100 people that show interest in an offering in a Reg A plus that will eventually invest, one or two of them will invest on their first visit typically. So you can get a sense there that uh, it's a much more optimistic kind of investment flow. It's Reg A pluses are public offerings as far as the SEC is concerned with a capital P and a capital O. They're not initial public offerings unless they list on a major exchange, obviously, but they are public offerings with some post listing, post offering uh, reporting obligations like a gap audit every year and six months, man every six months management financials and major events and of change in the business must be reported as they occur. Um, the, one of the biggest factors in Reg A Plus is using it when it works, right? You know, there are a lot of companies that are strong, that are, have substance that don't resonate in an online marketing context, which is typically what we're using to raise money for companies in Reg A Plus. So that is a big part of what we do is help you assess if you should use this instrument or not, rather than just going forward anyway and finding out the hard way that it's... Uh, not going to work or you know there are there are situations where uh, i had a great call with a company two days ago which has uh, interesting a very nice business great team great backing already but they're in a difficult place to you know their business is hard to explain and we can figure that out sometimes by testing it but um we shouldn't just forge forward on the assumption that difficult to explain business is going to be an automatic success in Reg A plus because it's not that way. Um, uh, some other aspects of Reg A plus that make it unique. Um, Main Street investors play a very large role because they're the most easy to reach. If they like the company, if they understand it, if they find it important to their lives, as in the case of some of the biotech companies like, uh, you know, Cures for cancer, things of that type are very motivating. Pain treatments and things of that type. <clears throat> um, we uh, hosted an offering and advised an offering for a company called Insight Due Biologics. Their cost of advertising, just the advertising cost, we got it down to $3.30 per $100 raise, which is the best that we've been able to accomplish so far. Um, because it was a compelling offering, addressing, uh, providing a non-opioid pain uh, relief medicine for surgeons to use 
uh, when they're conducting surgery. So, you know, that's an example where a lot of the investors were doctors because they could see the need and anesthetists. So the average investment amount was $8,000 plus. Uh, but also a lot of Main Street folks really, you know, with the opioid epidemic the way it is, resonated with and wanted to participate in and in, uh, investing in that company. It isn't necessary to have a broker dealer on a Reg A plus, but it does make it easier to get uh, investments from the problem states. You can do it otherwise, but it's particularly difficult with the state of Florida. The other states can be handled more easily. Um, you get to build brand and awareness in many cases. If it's a consumer product, we're, we're really promoting the product that, to its customer base at the same time as raising capital for it. And you can use investor incentives, which is nice. You can incentivize people to invest more than they might have by giving them discounts on services, discounts on products and so forth. Liquidity, the SEC considers any investor in a Reg A plus to be able to sell their security right away. They don't have to wait. That does not mean there's liquidity immediately. We'll get into that further. One of the nice things about Reg A plus is that by getting qualified by the SEC, your company is different. You've distinguished yourself automatically from many, many other companies that have not been qualified by the SEC. So it gives you credibility in joint venture discussions and so forth, strategic partner arrangements where you wouldn't otherwise have had it. That was a nice bonus that I hadn't anticipated. I'll get into costs and so forth in a minute. The downsides of Reg A Plus are that it takes typically four months from beginning the process to be qualified and ready to raise money in the fifth month. That it costs time, um, time and effort and money up front to do that. Uh, typically, it's going to cost one hundred and thirty or one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That's pretty much the low end of the range to get your to get the company to the point that it is qualified and ready to raise money. So you know, a lot of companies aren't in the situation where they have the ability to do that. The maximum for Reg A Plus has been increased to seventy five million dollars per year now. Why it's an advantage to use Reg A Plus for an IPO, um, these are the reasons. The service providers, particularly the auditor, because you're doing a US GAAP audit, uh, and the securities law firm are much less expensive when you're doing a Reg A Plus, even though you intend to convert it into an S1, sorry, convert it into a listed IPO and subsequently convert it into a full S1 reporting company. The upfront costs and the costs to reach that point are far lower. The other big advantage is that <clears throat> you, you raise the money you've raised, right? You know, if you've raised, say, $16 million or so prior to uh, going to list the company, that money is in escrow already, uh, or you've already drawn it down from escrow. Uh, unlike in an S1 IPO, where if the minimum to list was $15 million, then you don't get access to a dollar unless you ex exceed, reach or exceed that number. So that can be a very expensive journey when a company doesn't make it um, for obvious reasons. And then of course, because in a Reg A+, plus, unlike in an S1, you're encouraged and allowed to market the offering to your, to your audience of investors and consumers that like what you're doing. Um, then you're building brand awareness, you're building momentum even before having listed the company. So the, getting a lot of brand ambassadors out there earlier on is a very big advantage, obviously. <clears throat> Two approaches to a NASDAQ IPO, excuse me, <coughs> via, via Reg A+. Plus. The one that's been done primarily to date is by bringing in un, uh, underwriters, creating a syndicate at the front end, uh, and then having them raise the capital and list the company. Um, that's a viable way to go, and we can help put together that, uh, bring in the underwriters, help you create the pitch, help you figure out which ones to work with and make sure you get a good deal from them. Um, so that's one way to go. In the case of the Arkimoto uh, Reg A Plus IPO, 
uh, Hambrick, W.R. Hambrick was the underwriter and uh, we hosted the offering and uh, the, that is the only Reg A plus IPO to date where they raised a significant amount of money from Main Street investors as well as listed the company. So they raised uh, $4 million in four weeks, five weeks online, which was a superb success. And the balance, $15.5 million through the underwriter syndicate. That's a, that was a, a great success, and I was glad that we were a part of that. Um, given the excitement level in the IPO space, a lot of companies that we're hearing from that want to IPO are not able to get engagement from underwriters up front because they've got easier, easier fish to fry elsewhere, frankly. So the other way to go, which makes sense and controls costs too, is to uh, raise the money online, build enough momentum that it's already successful. And we already have then essentially a very much easier transaction for an underwriter or underwriters to participate in. In that case, you need to leave enough headroom, enough money left to raise in the offering that it's going to be worthwhile for the underwriters, but also have raised enough prior to that it's clearly a success. So let's say you're raising 20 million, you've raised, say, 14 million, and we go out and approach the underwriters, then we'll get a better deal. It's easier to get them involved. And really, it's a walk in the park for them to, uh, to raise the money and list the company. And it isn't necessary to use underwriters anyway. You could do a direct listing uh, that has not yet been done uh, via Reg A+, but uh, I'm looking forward to that. You also get a better financial arrangement from the underwriters in that case as well, of course. So marketing, uh, actually going back to schedule, in, in the, as is known, I'm sure you guys mostly are fully aware, once qualified, you have a year in which to raise the money in your Reg A+. Plus. So it might take six months to cost effectively raise enough money that you're ready to approach the underwriters uh, and bring them in. That won't take very long. Uh, and then do the IPO once FINRA has blessed the transaction. Okay, so going to uh, marketing and costs, I mentioned the upfront cost. In a, in a Reg A plus that's above eight or $10 million, then the all in cost of capital, assuming it's an offering that, that uh, we should be doing, um, is, excuse me, I got distracted by new folks joining the webinar. I was hoping they were getting dealt with, which they are by our gosh, thank you. Um, the, uh, where was I going here? Marketing cost, da -da 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 -da. Yeah, yeah, so for a raise of above $10 million, then it's gonna be likely that the total all-in cash cost will be 10 to 12%. Of course, you can spend more. Uh, but and bringing in a, a broker dealer will increase the cost. We typically bring in a 1% broker dealer to get into the problem states easily. So they charge 1% on all of the capital raised, although that isn't a requirement that makes it easier. But when it comes to uh, having raised enough money that a broker dealer will add value by going out to their investor network, which happens later after it's clearly already a success, uh, then uh, the cost of doing so is gonna be 7%, 8% of the, of the money that they raise. And potentially might, they'll want to charge money on the, the, the ongoing capital raised on the platform, which can be too expensive. So that's part of the, uh, that's part of the negotiation process, frankly, and it's easier to do these days than it used to be. Um, in the retail marketing, in the online marketing side of things, how are we doing on time? We're okay. Um, we normally don't want to have you spend a lot of money up front because in the very early stages, we are figuring out the target audience. We're figuring out what messaging works best. So $10,000 uh, of media spend is enough in the first month in order to figure that stuff out when maybe it gets stepped up to a higher number like 20 or 30K in the second month, even on a very large raise, because there's no point spending lots of money until we've got the efficiency up. The typical experience we have is that in that first month, we'll raise 
that we, the company, will raise three to five times as much as that advertising spend, even when we're still, you know, very early on figuring it out. So that's very inefficient, but it's also much more efficient than you could expect in some ways, whilst we're testing out and learning a lot. The biggest expense is marketing, with or without broker dealers, um, you know, you don't raise 50 million or 70 million dollars online in a year or in an offering in a year without doing a lot of marketing unless you have a very large fan base or unless you have a very large uh, excited group of people like tesla would have if they were raising money with a new division of the company or something of that ilk a company that we're in discussions with had publicity they weren't intending for a breakthrough technology that they're developing and they have i think tens of millions of dollars of people who are attempting to invest and uh, cannot until they get something sorted and they're planning to do a reggae plus i hope with us because it's a very exciting company okay so i cover the cost overall cover the upfront cost earlier um yeah we've got that sorted so now i'm going to move into um secondary offerings so we haven't seen well, what we've tended to see so far is companies that are largely penny stock companies doing secondary offerings. We haven't seen too many blue chip companies or any blue chip companies doing Reg A plus secondary offerings yet. At the $75 million level, we'll see more. And as the awareness of Reg A plus builds, we'll see more. But um, to me, the big issue with companies that are penny stock companies, you know, with market caps remarkably low and, you know, they've been struggling for some time, typically, if they're a penny stock. Um, it's challenging to, even though you can adjust the share price in your Reg A plus as you go, it's very challenging to handle it unless you are really well prepared with good news uh, to support the public price of your list of your existing liquid stock very rarely is that done well very rarely is it possible for a company that's got this remarkably low valuation to keep the share price high enough to make it worthwhile for people to make them happy campers if they're investing at a higher price in the reg a plus so my recommendation for you for those of you who are considering this path is to consider introducing another security. I'm not an, un we aren't underwriters. We're not valuation professionals. We're not allowed to tell you what to do. I'm observing here what we see working. Um, so a company uh, that I like what they're doing, uh, a company that I like, excuse me, a company that I, a company that has figured out a good way to go, in my view, is Origin Clear. They're a penny stock company listed on the pink sheet, so this is not ideal, but they are making a new security sale in their Reg A+. Plus. It's a $20 million transaction, which pays, a, I think it's a 10% dividend monthly. So that's a dead instrument. It's a good transaction, and they're separating it from their heinously depressed stock price. Obviously, in an ideal world, you would do a reverse split of some magnitude, and have enough going on in the business and enough momentum to support uh, a, a viable share price. But as many of you may be aware, it isn't just it isn't enough just to get it to that point. You have to keep it there by having series a series of good announcements that that essentially prevent naked shorting by investors, or more likely, really, excuse me, naked shorting isn't by investors, but naked shorting by stockbrokers because they're not limited as to how much they can do that. That's the big problem for a lot of companies that are out there. Okay, so that's to my mind, the main issue is that offer a security that's gonna fly in a secondary. If it's a blue chip company that's got great momentum, you know, at Svantec, we did 16 consecutive quarters where we beat our, our analysts' expectations after we went public, right? That was not casual, that was non-trivial, it wasn't random but it made us a blue chip, excuse me, it made us the darling of many investors and uh, institutional investors, but it takes one hell of a lot of work, quite a lot of good luck and a lot of preparation uh, and a conservative approach to uh, setting expectations in the markets. 
Going on now, how are we doing on time? Now we're doing good, doing well. Divisions of large companies. I've been surprised how few people are aware of Reg A Plus. It's, it's still, after five and a half years out in the market, there's so, so many entities that aren't aware of it. Divisions of major companies that need to raise capital but aren't going to get it from the parent company for whatever reason, if they get allowed by the parent company, they can go out and do an offering and raise money in a Reg A plus. Then it's a matter of should they, is it cost effective? You know, does what they do appeal? That whole dynamic, which we can help them with. But um, there's a lot of companies that are public already and have divisions that are doing various things that would like to raise more capital and really could very successfully via Reg A plus. So I encourage companies to look at that. Everything I've said to date um, applies except, you know, is a public company going to want to have a division become a public entity on its own? Probably not. It's possible though, right? So less of the IPO part, but more of the cost and success, what it takes to succeed part applies. And that leads into the next aspect, which is that you can do consecutive years Reg A plus off. You can do yearly Reg A plus offerings. If you start the preparation uh, of the next one before the end of the first one or the current one, you can even do it without having any any significant lapse between them. Of you know maybe a day or two when you switch over, and. You know, there, there are a couple of reasons to do it. One is, one is obvious, raise more capital. Another is that by doing so, you support the aftermarket for your shares or your, you know, your securities. Uh, if, you're, if you raised money last year at $4 a share and you're now raising money in a new Reg A plus at $6 a share, even if it isn't a big raise, you are providing support in the aftermarket for your security price. That's a good thing. Post Reg A plus liquidity is a very interesting subject for a number of reasons. Um, obviously, companies that use Reg A plus to list on one of the major exchanges have great liquidity, uh, as well as the restrictions that go with being a public company. But what isn't generally known, I think, in Reg A plus is that unless the issuer, unless your company locks your other investors, like the founders and other longer term investors, unless you lock them up, they automatically are made liquid subsequently by the Reg A plus. So there are limits on that. But um, the main point is that um, let's say you just finished your Reg A plus. The first reporting point after that, which would typically be in an unlisted company, uh, the six months management financials or the annual gap audit. Once you've made that announcement of results, then all of the insiders are allowed to sell their securities for two weeks um, of, with limits of volume, you know, 1% of float, and there won't be much float if you're not listed anywhere. So I'm not saying this is a panacea, but the, the fact that uh, those securities are liquid is very valuable and that provides an incentive to list the stock someplace and then it's a matter of where if it's not going to be on the NASDAQ where would it be so that liquidity thing is a big advantage um, it is limited in total scope especially for the for the insiders um, 30 percent a year of the size of the most recent Reg A plus raise but um, the, the other aspect of this is that passive investors who own less than 10% of your company who might have been in it for six or eight years, they're made liquid and they're not limited by uh, the production of financials. They're not limited by the 1% of float either. They can just go out and sell their securities unless you lock them up. So that's a really big advantage uh, that not, not everyone's aware of. So then we go to where to list the company. Obviously, we've been discussing the NASDAQ and we've discussed the OTC. Something important to bear in mind about using Reg A plus to list your company. This doesn't apply in the case of having already done a reverse merger. But if you are, uh, uh, if your company is making its first 
public offering via Reg A plus and you choose to list on the OTC QB or QX, then your reporting obligation remains that of, actually in the QB case, it remains exactly the same, which is six months management financials, annual US gap audit and material change reports as they occur. If you list on the QX, then you need to produce management financials every quarter, but still only once a year US gap audit. So it's a lot less expensive than the PCAOB quarterly reporting obligation audit reporting obligation of a company that is a shell that you purchased, or you know, if you're on the NASDAQ or on the NYSE. One thing that I'm very, uh, frankly, very excited about for Reg A Plus companies is the existence now of a number of aftermarket exchanges where Reg A Plus shares can be bought and sold in the aftermarket. Uh, without great expense, without great complication, and most importantly, without naked shorting. So stockbrokers can't come along and put a naked short on these exchanges. So we're receiving, I'm receiving inquiries and you know the desire to explain which you know, from a number of them how great they are. And I'm, I'm in the process of uh, evaluating how great they are. And we'll be bringing, helping our companies uh, choose which ones to list on to provide aftermarket liquidity for their, uh, for their shareholders. So I like that so much because it's simple, right? It makes it much, much simpler to provide uh, liquidity in that way for your investors. They want that and uh, producing it, doing it in that way doesn't solve every issue by any stretch, but as long as the company is performing well and or that you are perhaps in another raise promoting the the promoting your company as an investment, then it's going to make it make that post offering liquidity much more viable. And some of these guys are doing a good job. You know, I've spoken to a few already and I like what I'm seeing. I'm going to get into mistakes to avoid and tips and techniques, and then I'll get to questions and answers. So please feel free to put questions in the, uh, the chat feature of Zoom. Um, don't set a high escrow minimum unless you have to. If you're buying a building, if you're going, if your sole purpose in the offering is to raise $20 million to buy a company and the price is $20 million, then you don't have any choice, right? But um, the problem with doing that, of course, is you have a lot of expense before you get to close escrow. It just gets very cash cash flow negative until you close escrow. We, so wherever possible, uh, have a zero minimum. That's, that is the norm unless you're buying an asset. Don't set a low maximum raise, set a higher maximum raise because there could be some pleasant surprises for you during your one year offering, like it was easier to raise the money than you thought. Uh, or that you have an acquisition opportunity that's come along and now you can fund it more easily. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So set a higher maximum than you need. There is no reason to set a lower one. And then you don't have to hassle with trying to change that post offering. Don't waste time with tier one. Probably in 2020, we'll find that 2% of capital raised via Reg A plus was in tier one. Virtually nobody does it anymore. Um, I will dwell on that, just avoid tier one. Two-year audits are required. Two-year audits are only required if your company has been around for two years. You know, if your company has existed for a year, then a year audit is fine. Some people get confused by that. Nasdaq does require that companies which list Reg A plus IPO companies that list on the Nasdaq have at least a two-year operating history. So you know you can't have done something else and then come along and form a brand new entity that has no history and go public on the nasdaq via reg a plus if you have a history that's a good thing in order to uh, support that transaction the biggest single mistake to avoid in reg a plus i would say the two biggest mistakes to avoid really one is um self-serving very self-serving which is don't do it yourself you know, we have this frustrating experience from time to time with companies that approach us and there's characteristics that they show as they go through it that I recognize now. 
and I call them do-it-yourselfers, and very few of them end up succeeding, basically. Uh, so I recommend not doing that. Use the professionals. We're good, we're great, I'm biased, <laughs> but there are other companies out there doing this as well. I would recommend that you work with experts uh, that rather than do it yourself. The second big, big thing to, to avoid is doing a Reg A plus when you shouldn't be doing it because it's not gonna work, you know? If it's too hard to explain your business, you can, if you have a company that's solid uh, and is difficult to explain, then you can raise money via a debt offering that pays an attractive dividend, preferably monthly, uh, then that can be a good way to go. If you can carry that, if you're ready to do it, and if you can carry that burden, um, then some companies will make a reserve for a few years in order to be able against capital raise in order to pay that dividend. That's the case where you've got a company that's solid, but boring and hard to explain, hard to motivate people to invest in. But my point is that it's really important not to waste your time doing an offering that is by definition not going to succeed. That's where we add a lot of value up front. The last thing we want to do is, is help you do an offering that's preordained to fail, right? What's the point? We're all about doing offerings that succeed and where the investors will celebrate that they that they participated later. That's it, those are our two biggest goals. And I'm, I'm sure they're yours as well. Setting a high per investor minimum. A lot of companies that haven't done a Reg A plus come from, you know, it's sort of the higher the minimum amount, the more, the better it feels, perhaps the more credible your company is, you know, it feels good to have a high minimum when you're dealing in Reg D, but in Reg A plus, the dynamic when you're marketing, and again, this is almost always the case, we're marketing a raise to lots of people who they were doing something else and they see a social media advertisement which appeals to them and they parachute in for a few seconds to look at the offering. Now we've got to quickly show them that what they thought they were going to see, they're seeing, that it's compelling and exciting, that it's credible. They're allowed to do it. They're allowed to invest in it. And that the amount of money that you, the minimum amount that they have to invest is play money for them, right? So if you set the max, the minimum to be per investor $5,000, it's the kiss of death. The vast majority of people that will parachute in, if they see the 5K, they're gone and they're not coming back because that's, that's more than play money. They might come, if they, were, if they were hypothetically to stay the course and stay involved and like it and love it, they might invest 5K later, but we've lost their attention forever uh, already. So have a high, have a low minimum, like 200, 300, 400 dollars, uh, in order to lose the minimum number of engaged investors. And then they'll invest, and then they'll monitor it, and if they like it, they'll invest more. And then in a few months, they might come back from their managed IRA and invest a heck of a lot more. And that's what tends to happen. So. That's one I, I covered that item adequately. Let's see. Yeah, avoid big name, expensive law firms. Many of them don't know Reg A plus and charge a lot of money and take a long time. We want people that are experts in this space. We have, that's what we do. We specialize in bringing the service providers in that know what they are doing and are cost effective and time effective. Absolutely avoid big name auditors because they may never get the audit done. We had one company planning a New York Stock Exchange IPO. The NYSE loved the company. It was a grow, one of those unusual companies growing in a very rapid clip and highly profitable at the same time. You just don't see that very often. And yet they were irreversibly attached to having Deloitte do their audit. And there were two non-US entities and a US entity and this company was too small for Deloitte to get out of their own way. And they never did get an audit done in time, a simple US gap audit. And in the end, the board told the CEO to can the whole idea. And he did, he had no choice. He'd lost credibility with his board of directors. Big name auditors, very expensive. Another practice you see in even in mid range auditors is coming in and, and, and bidding a price for your US gap audit, which is not complex theoretically, and then jacking up the price when it's too late for you to switch. Because if you switch to another auditor, guess what? You have to start all over again. They can't depend on the work done by the prior auditor. So 
be careful with the auditing side of things. We, and we have great auditors that we recommend that uh, aren't going to do that kind of thing, obviously. If taking, expecting to only raise money in the US is easier generally, and then it's not that easier, not so much easier because a lot of people outside the US would love to invest in US companies that they might not otherwise get into. So expanding your reach and then getting the agent, the marketing agency to do so is big. Using debit and credit cards is not risk-free, especially credit cards, because uh, the investors can go back to the credit card company and ask their money back. But it's a heck of a lot easier for the investor to invest when you take debit or and or credit cards. So it's a good thing to do to make it easier, reduce the marketing expense. In my view, the way I look at it is if you've got an investor that wants their money back and you're allowed to give them the money back, give them the money back. You don't want squeaky wheels out there that are unhappy. But easy for me to say, right? Remote control, no, it isn't all going to happen on its own. There's a lot of work involved internally. We'll coach you through the relevant learning, especially front end loaded. How are we doing on time? Doing, doing fine. Um, don't neglect social media. The primary online source of raising capital is through social media advertising. The lovely thing is that when people like it, they'll share your ads. It's a lovely dynamic. The bad news is there are people out there that want to poison the well, and they will. And you need to expect that there'll be some amount of time involved in uh, responding to genuine questions in social media and on the offering page, obviously. But social media is where the problem lies because there are people who, for some reason, want to poison the well, make allegations that aren't justified and you know, really create a negative vibe. So it takes a proactive, positive, engaged effort on somebody's part on the team internally to engage with those folks in order to manage that. You can't just delete the messages because the SEC says, hey, you want to market this stuff? It's open forum. If somebody's got a legitimate criticism, that has to stay public. You, like, you want to have the praise, you want to have the shares, you've got to have both sides of the coin. Another aspect that the SEC cares greatly about is equal information. So we'll help you with that. You know, if you answer a question that's an awkward new one, you, before you answer it, you've got to decide, do I want to answer this because I'm going to have to publish the answer and the question so everyone gets equal information. So, you know, that's a useful filter, but that's a detail to get into more than we need to right now. You can change this. If it's a share offering, you can change the share price during the raise. If it's a debt offering, you can change the terms of the off of the debt offering during the raise with proper preparation. The SEC is more responsive. They're doing a faster job of turning around Reg A plus offerings than prior to COVID. And um, I'm digressing into COVID for a moment. And the cost of marketing our company's offerings is lower than before COVID, significantly, 8, 10, 12% less than it used to be. Uh, so that's a, a very positive dynamic. It makes sense when you go and study what's gone on in the past, especially in China, where they've had more lockdown type activities with viruses in the past. Um, in each case, there was a surge of increased activity with online businesses, which sustained thereafter. And we're experiencing that because guess what? What are we doing? We are taking what was an in-person kind of activity, brick and mortar based, putting it online. It's going virtual and this is accelerating Reg A plus and other aspects of uh, online investing, crowd investing, if you will. Okay, so I'm going to, I've got some other questions here, but I'm going to refer to the questions that are in the comments section now. Bear with me, guys. I'll start at the top of the list. I will focus on questions that I can add value to. And I'll focus on them in the sequence they can come in. Reg D compared to Reg A plus, I'll be very brief on this. Um, Reg D is all, you're allowed to disclose more. 
Uh, it's quicker to get to market because you don't have to go capitan or ask the SEC and go through a qualification process, so it's quicker. It's just much more difficult to get on the radar with accredited investors because they have so many lovely opportunities coming to them the whole time and um, they're skeptical. So if the substance is there, they'll invest. But uh, it's all about all about that. Reg A plus is easier. We're dealing with optimists who are investing and they're less expensive to reach because they don't have a bazillion options. Handouts or materials, yeah. So what I, there were two things after this, of, after this webinar. One is we will make a record, we are making a recording of the webinar. We will produce a blog post with an index on it. So you can go to the parts you like of this and go check them out without having to see everything else. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Maybe what we'll do, what we will do because of that question, we'll send each of you uh, an email follow up with some links in it that, uh, that shows relative, relevant content in our platform. We have a host of Reg A plus information in the Manhattan Street Capital platform, in the blog and in the FAQ. And we'll send you a selection of that content. Can a yeah, question about breaking down costs. Yes, yeah, so typically the securities attorney is going to be in the range of 35 to 70 K for a, a good securities, a very, you know, very good securities attorney payable usually in three chunks, right? On signing, on filing with the SEC and on qualification. Uh, the marketing agency is the other biggest expense, preparing all of the right content, gearing up in order to make the offering. And there are some fees to us and the audit. The audits the, can be a very large expense, uh, depending on the complexity of your business, right? If you've got a long history, well, two years more, two years or more, and you have multiple divisions, especially offshore divisions, you know, then it's going to be expensive and more time consuming. You need to have a US GAAP audit to, to file your tier two Reg A plus uh, before you can't actually file it without that. You can do test the waters and check out the excitement level uh, for your offering without anything, without a filing, without an audit, et cetera, et cetera, a different story. But um, I covered the gland roughly there. Once the year has passed after becoming qualified, can a company extend for another year by yes? Yes, it isn't simply an update. It is, if you did the same style of offering, it's kind of an update, right? Because you already know what you did before and you don't change it much. So it gets through the SEC easier. You don't have to wait until the end of the current one. You can file the new one prior to, so that doesn't have to be a lapse at all, but you can have a lapse if you want and then come back and do the same thing again. $75 million for a SPAC, right? So huh, I think a SPAC, actually a SPAC as a SPAC where no one knows what the hell it's gonna do. No, you can't do that. You can't, it's essentially a blank check company and you can't do a Reg A plus for a blank check company. If you establish a clear goal for your company, of what you are going to do in specific enough terms, then you can raise money via Reg A plus for it without having done the buying or licensing or whatever it takes to have a product or technology. You can do that, but only in the event that you are specific, right? Sort of like a venture fund with a difference. What are the pros and cons of doing a Reg A Plus compared with a reverse merger with a public company? The biggest thing I see is I see companies, we, we have one right now where they had been given bad advice. They'd done a reverse merger and they, you know, they have all the headaches of the PCAOB audits and the history of the prior company, which was not an exciting history. Owners of it, you know, the expense that goes along with that. You still have to raise the money, right? And you've got this security that's trading out there someplace with, with a depressed price. Uh, and that's a whole headache to deal with. It limits your flexibility in raising money. It makes life much more complex in most cases. There are some exceptions, I'm sure, but um, I suppose in an ideal world, you find a really clean shell 
that's on the shelf, as it were, that has no trading history, uh, and you buy that for a favorable price, and now you're already public, and you can uh, go ahead and trade as that liquid company, and you can raise money via regular price for it. So in that case, then it's a lot easier. You still have to be really well prepared to, 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 to protect the company from naked shorting by stockbrokers, right? That's the big problem out there that uh, kills so many liquid companies, so many public companies. Let me see if my, my oh, shoot, well, that cursor button didn't do me any favors. Let's go back where I was. My intention is to go on answering questions until 15 minutes after the hour. Um, that's my plan. Oh, yeah, yeah, come on, come on, come on. Sorry, guys. Almost there. How to get support or underwriters on board. So we, as, we have a service where we'll help you figure out if you should do that and then figure out how to pitch the company to the underwriters and then help you pitch them where I'll go to bat for you to the right ones that fit and pitch the company in order to get meetings with them, phone-based meetings, Zoom-based meetings these days and help you negotiate a, a, fair trans, a fair price, fair deal. We're a holding company and team state development company how to get support to maintain pricing on an exchange so support yeah right so uh, if you are working with us and you take your company onto an exchange where you're vulnerable i'll be happy to help with that if it becomes a huge task then there'll be some fees involved but otherwise not i have a lot of experience in this space uh, and i understand what it takes so happy to help with that it's a big deal um, it's a good question to ask because it's a big deal. It, it is not a free ride to be a public company. There's a lot of work involved in managing expectations of the financial community and then delivering on them and having a culture internally to develop as much predictability as is humanly possible, as, along with good news announcements that scare off the naked short folks. What are the methods and types of platforms you guys use to market the reggae once it's qualified? So methods, it's primarily, you know, I would say most of it's obvious. And I think it's obvious, which is social media advertising. That's a very big piece of the puzzle. Uh, engaging with um, audiences that love the company. Maybe there are partners, distributors, dealers. Uh, doctors, anesthetists, you know, people who are involved in the, your business and appreciate what you're doing or will be involved in your business and appreciate what you're doing. Customers, vendors of that, all of the above, you know, we have a, we have a VIP investment feature where you can go to these folks before the reggae plus is qualified, set the stage, invite them to participate at the initial security price. Uh, uh, with a plan to raise the security price as long as the communication is done properly, which is delicate. Uh, and then you're doing a favor for them and you know, you'll get more early traction that way. A really interesting development is companies is that there's a new type of financial analyst that's evolved, which is really newsletters. And there are some good newsletters like angels and entrepreneurs, which uh, essentially, they select companies they like, and then they tell their members about them, and their members are more likely to invest, and they have a big effect by doing that. They are paid by their members. There's no financial arrangement between them and the companies that are raising money in their Reg A+. Plus. So they are an incredibly valuable and important audience if they like your company. And there's about four of them, four groups that are, that are significant and have a big impact. Going to family offices matters. We're going to soon be launching a family office division within Manhattan Street Capital to serve their needs, to help them uh, decide which companies they want to play a part in. Um, that'll help our companies raise money more easily. Do you see Reg A Plus offerings for pure startup plays? Yes, when they are a compelling company, right? If it's 
usually a compelling brand new startup has people involved in it that are really kick-ass amazing have done it before very successful and they've got a concept that's that's really attractive in which case yes reggae plus is a fine instrument it's 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 just when it's a weak company or a handkerchief you know and it doesn't have the right team then why are we doing this you know it's not going to work best practices to increase liquidity in respect to volume well, you know, in an IPO situation, one of the advantages of all these main street investors is you've got a lot of investors and that's great for liquidity. Um, beyond that, it comes down to, you know, not having naked shorts out there, depending where you're listed, right? And having great results from the company and having set expectations that you exceed and making a series of announcements that uh, are supportive of the company and are legitimate that you know aren't that easy to do but take a lot of take attention and really work please discuss cost in detail at what point we have to expect that's a bit too vague detail all costs yeah yeah we'll send you information on that um i can't detail it all right here right now but um the securities cost, the securities attorney cost will be lower for a secondary offering because the company is already public and already has practice and higher for a reg A plus that morphs into an IPO. What happens is you go public as the reg A plus and then right afterwards there's a series of filings that are made. And the most recent price I saw from a very high quality law firm was 90K all told for that. Saw so a brand new company funded by VC that went IPO on the NASDAQ with less than a year old. Yes. That's because NASDAQ's restriction on two years operating history applies to Reg A plus IPOs. It doesn't apply to uh, non Reg A plus IPOs, right? That's a, a fact of life. What exactly do we do? Well, thank you. That's a nice question. So we advise companies up front if they should do a Reg A plus or a Reg D. Um, or Reg CF, and if, if Reg CF currently, we'll send them to a Reg CF platform. Um, so upfront qualification, should you even do this, right? Do we think this is a viable company to for people to invest in? Obviously, we're helping decide that. What I'm trying to say is we're selective. We want to work with companies that we believe in, that we think investors will be pleased that they participated in later. That's easy to figure out generally. Although, of course, there are humongous numbers of risks involved, right? And taking companies on board and, and building them to be scaled and success, successful, many, many factors. The, um, so we bring in all of the different service providers that are needed to make a successful offering, right? So auditor, so as needed, law firm, um, marketing agency, not just one we'll figure out which is the best pr agency where appropriate um broker dealers where appropriate underwriters where appropriate so we make it our business to know who are the experts and, and for which your company would be a good fit um, and then we're involved in adding value to the extent we are allowed to right we aren't allowed to tell you what to do but we'll advise you about marketing or about testing maybe the early day you know the early traction isn't high enough the efficiency isn't good enough that i might be recommending to you and your agency that we hopefully we brought in normally the agencies that come from a further afield aren't as good um, i'm going to be recommending perhaps that uh, we do three different landing pages with three different primary messages that tie into three different types of ad campaigns in order to find out which resonates best. Because one of the big things I've learned in a huge amount of marketing experience that I have is even though I think I'm good, and I probably am, that doesn't mean I can tell ahead of time which is gonna work. Testing is sometimes so, so important and so, so valuable. So those kinds of things, right? And experimenting and learning what's working over there and applying it over here, yeah? So when we got the biotech companies, uh, media spend down to a $3.30 spend per $100 raised, I was a key part of that because I was challenging the agency 
to do video ads that they weren't doing. And it was a type of video ad that had a duration of six seconds that kicked the kicked ass. It was amazing. So it's by challenging them uh, and learning what works and applying it elsewhere that we get to help, right? So I have a gut feeling from our other Reg A plus offerings and Reg Ds, what's working and what isn't. So it doesn't take long to notice, right? An intuition of paying attention helps. So we're on board with you to make it succeed and to make it as cost effective as possible and as successful as possible across the board. Otherwise, why? Well, otherwise, you know, what's the point? Right? So that's that's what we do. So the 5K a month for us as a platform, what that includes is lots of reporting, lots of instrumentation that goes on. Um, it includes the ease of use of the platform, right? Which we spend constant, spend, constantly spend time in improving and improving to make it easy for people to invest. And it, 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 does, it does include, one way or the other, our fees include marketing where we promote not one offering at a time because we're not allowed to, because we've chosen not to be a broker dealer so we can do IPOs with underwriters. And for other reasons, it makes it more difficult for investors to invest if we were a broker dealer. Um, but so we aren't allowed to market one offering at a time. We are allowed to market all our offerings or all our reg A's or all our reg D's. So that's what we do. We promote them in social media. We have a large social media following and we promote them via email to our lists. We have a large list. We do not allow companies to promote to your list until your Reg A plus is finished. You bring in investors through your efforts that we help you with, but you're spending a lot of money bringing in investors. And uh, we don't allow ourselves, we don't promote other offerings to those new investors, and we don't allow other companies that are on our platform to promote themselves to your investors. If you look at any of our offerings, you'll see none of our offerings have in them a click here to explore other offerings, other investments button because you're spending a lot of money to bring in the investors. The last thing you want is 30% of them being siphoned off into, into other companies' raises, right? That's a matter of policy for us, and that's one of our unique things that no one else in North America has that policy. We are the only one in crowd investing that works in that manner. To my mind, that's a no-brainer. Um, yeah. So there's loads of other things we do in the platform and in the consulting side, you know, lots of reporting. We integrate every moving part in marketing to the platform, to the back end of the investment flow. So as people make good things happen, as an investor does something that's rewarding, like they, they go and bring in a bunch of money from the managed IRA, that gets, we tie that back to which ad was it? Which audience was it? On what time of day, what day of week? So that the agency gets smarter and smarter and more and more efficient all the time, right? So we're instrumenting everything in the back end and tying everything to all of the marketing outreach that's done 